Okay, we're in Austin, Texas right now. Gypsy Gentleman number two. This is the city of the Violet Crown. I'm standing on the corner of Annie and First. The cool thing about this street, Annie, is that it was named after a prostitute from the 1930s. So I think that's a pretty good way to start this thing out. The idea for Gypsy Gentleman 2 is that we're gonna present to you the birth of tattooing in America in the mid 20th century. We're gonna go to the Admiral Nemitz Museum, which is outside of Austin, and show you all of the World War II memorabilia out there and try and get you a feeling of what it was like to be a serviceman in the middle of the 20th century. Tattooing is exploding here. There are loads of great artists here. There's, you can see 60 live bands on any given night. A lot of really cool things going on in Austin. And we're gonna take you to this place called the Cathedral of Junk. Then we're gonna go visit a guy named Gary Martin who's probably one of the most notorious sign painters still working in the United States. So what we wanted to do is take you here, introduce you to the city, introduce you to some of the coolest tattooers here, and then uh, give you a little bit about the history of tattooing America. The ocean in that sets a man free. I'm leaving today. I miss your embrace. But there's a boat out there waiting for me. So darling, give me one last kiss. Okay, we're here at Martin Signs in Austin, Texas, and we're here to talk to Gary a little bit about the long-standing art of sign painting. You around, Gary? Yeah, come on in. Hey, how are you, man? Nice I'm to fine. see you. Nice to I'm see glad you. we finally got here. Yeah, come in. Uh, I started sort of on my own, and then mm -hmm. I moved to San Francisco. It was like in the 70s, and I just needed a job. Okay. And somehow I was just walking by a sign shop and they were loading something into a truck and it looked real heavy and so I said, hey, I'll help you. And I just started really? to move it, load it in the truck and then I said, I'm looking for a job. And they just said, well, you know, whatever. And I just got the job there and it was, you know. Yeah. And then I met a sign <laughs> painter that worked there and I liked and he said, uh, he said, you know, they do stuff the really stupid way here, you know, and I said, well, What's the better way? And so he started showing me stuff, and I, that's how it actually started. When did you break out on your own? Um, you know, different times, because I okay. worked for shops, and then at, at certain times, then I worked on my own, then worked at yeah. shops, worked on my own. So it's a good life. Yeah, yeah, it's a good yeah, life. Yeah, it's a good life. It's kind of laid back, meditative. So this is like more of the area where, do you do a lot of the painting out of here, or are you mixing here? Mixing colors. Okay. And cleaning brushes. Okay. Sign kit with brushes. So when you're when you're doing line we're gonna sign you brace, right? You got like a brace. traditional tool. The mall stick. The mall stick. And how does that work? Like you put this piece you sits against traditionally the, against the paint and you hit a brush like that and you can go down. Oh cool. So it. you're actually steering with the left, not just bracing and then moving yeah. your hand over. And you don't have to get your hand into the paint ever. So well, I can remember back like around <laughs> proper 19, fucks, um, man. 81 or something, okay. I remember uh, going to the time clock where I worked and some guy said, did you hear about that new machine that like cuts out letters out of vinyl and it's like sticky back and pressed on? He goes, we're fucked. <laughs> and I said, no, that's no. I said, no, I, no, we're not. He goes, yeah, yeah. yeah, we are. I go, <laughs> we're proper fucked, man. <laughs> you better wake up and smell the coffee, that sign painting is like, that's yesterday. And I go, well, I don't care. You know. Who's to blame? We all gave up, it's alright. Alcohol, will you never seem to help at all? But I know you well. 
the Cathedral of Junk, and we're going to meet Vince Hanneman, who's been building this beautiful cathedral for a number of years. And we came by this morning to, to meet him and to hear a little bit about the history of this really interesting place. So I'm going to get him out of his cave right now, and uh, we're going to check it out. Okay. Yeah, I did. Good morning. It's nice to meet you, Vince. Great. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. It's amazing. Oh, cool. Check it out. This is why we call this the Rainbow Room. Wow. This is so cool. So this is uh, this is the core of the cathedral. It's the first part that you built, or how, how did it come oh, to is, be? This is almost the last part of it that was built. Uh, this all came out of. Uh, easement over here. Last year the city made me get a building permit and in order to do that I had to chop 40 tons of stuff out of this wow. five foot set. Yourself just you in most of the Well way? no hundreds of volunteers came through here and helped uh -huh. me out and so while I had those folks here I didn't get rid of everything. 40 tons went over the scale so I know that. Okay. Plus this which is so how everything. much time was the 40 tons accumulated over, would uh, you say? Since 89, so, you okay. know, 21 years. So when you started, was it just like a weekly, you know, once a week you'd start doing it? Or was it an obsessive, spare like... time kind okay. of thing, definitely. And so what did it start with? Hubcaps along the fence. I'm a bit of a pack rat myself, you know. I have to purge periodically, but, you know, I see this... 40 know, tons worth? Well, <laughs> not that much, but... Yeah, I mean, just looking around, all of the cool elements and stuff, where are you getting most of this stuff from? Uh, mostly it's all donations. Like, oh, okay. After about the third year, I didn't need to go look for stuff anymore. For nice. me, this is fascinating, you know? You so, have a nice day. Yeah, yeah, and I really appreciate it. All right, man. All right, that's One shot of women, one shot of work, one shot of sweater, Most of the first people who got heavily tattooed in America were all servicemen serving mostly in the Pacific Theater during the Second World War. So most tattooers, shops were within five miles of the military bases. And the big paydays were right after all the servicemen got paid. I mean, many times there'd be 20, 30 guys lined up around the block waiting to get their tattoo. To this day, outside of Austin, uh, there's a museum called the Admiral Nemitz, which is the Pacific War Theater Museum. And we're gonna be filming there. We're gonna take a couple cool tattooers from a shop called Rock of Ages here in Austin. Tony Hundall and Steve Byrne there, and we're gonna look at all of the stuff from that period of time, the Second World War, and then Steve and Tony and I, we're gonna do historical tattoos based on the old, the old Navy designs of that period, those designs which brought tattooing into the forefront in America. the galleries here with Tony Hundall and Steve Byrne, two very well-known traditionalist tattooers. And what we're going to do is we're going to walk around the galleries so we can get a sense of what it was like to be a serviceman in the 40s in America participating in the Pacific War. Let's go check it out. There was a time you drove the devil out of me the line between the patriotic, you know, 
sympathies of all of the graphics in the time and the yeah. tattooing. It's so parallel. Oh, yeah. I mean, loose lips sink ships. Yeah. Yeah. I started in Washington. I grew oh, up in Washington, Washington State. State. Yeah, okay. started in Everett, State, kind yeah. of the white trash brother to Seattle. It's you know, it's all blue collar. Yeah. Everybody works for Boeing that's up there. Or, okay. You know, you know, shit like that. But so I started there, and then you know, as always does for one reason or another, shit hit the fan, and I had to fucking move and. Basically sold everything I owned and moved to Texas because I had a couple other friends that were moving to Florida and I had kind of an open-ended job offer in my now ex-wife's parents town okay. So it was like we go there for a few months and then figure out what the fuck to do and then I've just been in Texas ever since You know oh. When was this? Like mm -hmm. how long ago was this? We got into Texas New Year's Day 2002 and it was really in hindsight the best thing I could have done you know, the shop was super busy. It's right by an Air Force base, like an Air Force training base. So it's like a constant, you know, we'd have the payday weekends is what we all called them. Yeah. If the airmen got their paychecks early enough on Friday that they could get them cashed, that next Saturday morning, like we'd open at noon and there'd be 20 guys lined up waiting to get in when we opened the door. Yeah. I was, I work workers shops like that. You put, what's their name? Everybody on the list? puts their name on the list. Every the whole, I mean, gigantic shop. Every single piece of flash has a price on it. Yeah. Every George, single, every single. Yep, yeah. Yeah. And by two o'clock, you'd have eighty people on the list waiting. To, all first come, first serve. Yeah. Since they've joined the military, this is the first opportunity they've had to go out and do something on the weekend. And they've been stocking some money. And the too. first thing they would see is there's two or three tattoo shops. Yeah, you know, so we. Plus I mean, they're like right out of the box, and they're so yeah, desperately green. Yeah, it's like they want to be part of eighteen-year-old kids, yeah. you know, that, and they'd be standing in line in their dress blues, you know, like hoping that nobody saw them because they're not supposed to be there dressed that way. Oh, right. But they yeah. didn't want to lose their spot in line, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I mean, you'd literally just have people sitting on the floor for eight hours until their name got called. Yeah. You know. Yeah, we. I remember we get in on Saturday morning, and there'd be like twenty-five people hanging around. Yeah. And they'd all run with standard you know, fare. We'd just line the counter with release forms and they'd all be standing at the door like waiting as soon as you open the door they'd all be elbowing each other trying to get up there and fill out the release form as fast as they could and be the first guy on the list yeah yeah you know because otherwise they, it might be you know if you're the fifth guy on the list you might have to sit there for two hours you know yeah. and you start getting tattooed before you were a tattooer yeah i uh i when i was like 14 15 i have like hand poked tattoos on myself I didn't I even did know the to, same thing didn't Left even know arm, to like punk dip, rock thing dip yeah. the needle in ink I would just dribble a line of ink <laughs> just dribble a line and then sit and stab into it <laughs> not to move for so 10 minutes fall away yeah, from stab the... into it for 10 minutes and wipe it off and see what I had done so I, I you know I did some of those on myself when I was young and but not really with any intention or even no, really any, any idea of what really tattooing was or you know i didn't have an uncle that had an eagle on his arm i i was never really exposed to anything like that you know like yeah. all i knew was that henry rollins was the most tattooed motherfucker i'd ever seen and he was fucking cool as shit so i needed to get some tattoos quick <laughs> you know yeah everything i know about drawing or anything else or art or i've learned it all through tattooing and through trial and error and too. through trial and error you know like i take risks with the on the skin with the t you know like mm -hmm. well i think this will work but i've never tried it before i think this will look cool but i've never tried it before yeah but i you know i'm a tattooer that's the medium that that's that i'm the most comfortable with
my grandfather was, you know, he was he was a World War II veteran. Like he had a lot of books in his house about stuff like that. It was it was actually a movie. It was a skit from New York where Kurt Russell's got this fucking viper on his stomach, like his cobra. Whatever snake Plissken. Snake Plissken. Yeah, yeah, of course. And I've got a snake here right now. So I mean, it, it resonated with me somehow. You know, like I remember yeah. was, my dad letting me watch this as a kid. Thinking this is this is probably too violent for me at this age, you know. <laughs> My dad's probably like, uh, "You could watch it soon," you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean uh, that that tattoo on him. I thought to myself, that thing is cool, you know. And yeah, like what age are we talking? Like fourteen, eight, eight or nine, maybe. Oh, that young. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that was probably that was probably my first actual memory of noticing what a tattoo was. And I moved to Leeds when I was just eighteen, like okay. so like the week after my eighteenth birthday. Um, and very quickly fell in with a crowd of people that were tattooed and it was a bigger city, a bit more cosmopolitan, you know, yeah. there was punk scene, you know, like an art scene, you know, all that kind of stuff going on there and I met, I met a guy who was very new to tattooing himself and, you know, we got talking and this is like six months after I moved there and he's like, you should be a tattooer, you know, like that mm -hmm. kind of thing. You know, he had a machine, had been tattooing a little oh, bit. Okay. So I think he'd only been working for maybe a year or so. Okay. You know, just kind of finding his way. And Out of his own pad or in uh, shop? I think in like, kind of like a, just like a crummy little back street sort of yeah, stuff, yeah. you know, like something that wasn't even that serious. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Like back then, I mean, you're only talking about 15 years ago, I suppose, but it wasn't even a career for that many people, you know what I mean? It was just, yeah, yeah. you can dip in and out of it and might, you would have something on the side, you know, like, you know, what we're talking about with sign painting, back, 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 you know, in the day. Yeah. But yeah, I think he would paint a little bit and tattoo a little bit and come and go from it and yeah, not, yeah. not really know whether it was going to pan out for him, you know, I think. So did he, had you been tattooed yet? Oh yeah, yeah, I got my, <laughs> I got my first ones when I was like 15, 16 and, uh, you know, I would just look down at them and be like, well, they don't look like what <laughs> I'd been seeing you yeah, know, yeah. in magazines or in CD artwork. Or, you know, yeah, yeah. Kind of, the stuff that I was taking to the guys to tell me. And then I was looking at it and I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. this isn't exactly what I imagined, you know. But you live and learn. And, I, you know, my early tires, they're, they're terrible, but I don't regret them ever because it made me want to be a tire, you know. And yeah. I was lucky, you know, I mean, me and Tony together. We've talked about this. You get you get started early, eighteen, nineteen, whatever. It's great because you know you got no commitments. There's no family or anything like that to yeah, think yeah. about. You know you can just be focused hundred percent on one thing and you know soak it up like a sponge. And that's that's a, that's something I'm always sort of thankful for was an early start. You know. So I mean, I just gunned after the job at Rock of Ages. You know, just talked yeah. to Jason, talked to Tony, said that. I was thinking about moving to America. I had, I had a visa application in process, you know, all kinds of stuff. And it was the shop I wanted to be in. There was really not another shop. Something like Austin, it's, you know, it's a great city to live in. Food, music, everything that I'm into. But also the Southern exactly. ability to relax. Exactly, and you know, it doesn't, you don't have to like, you know, you don't have to work yourself into the ground to, to be able to live nicely here, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I, 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 I kind of felt, like the pace of Rock of Ages was gonna be really suitable for me. It's a street shop, something I hadn't been in for a long time, but it was also high quality, unique tattooing, which is what I wanted to be, you know, surrounded by. We're at the end of our tour at the Admiral Nemitz Museum, and now we're going to go down to the Yellow Jacket Social Club, and we're going to draw some tattoos based on this experience of being here in the Pacific War Museum. You know, there is a sort of Texas style. Oh, yeah. I'm, yeah. I mean, I've... It's been almost 10 years I've been in Texas now, so I've tattooed in Texas, you know, longer than anywhere. Yeah, what, what do you think defines that style? I don't know. 
Yeah. That's yeah, weird. I, you I, know I, it, then you see yeah, it, though, I, right? Yeah, you yeah. know it. You know, like saturation. Like, yeah. Bold yeah, strength. Just crazy, wild. You know, like mm -hmm. just tattoos you can't really not look at. Yeah. You know. Well, I mean, tattooing itself, it has to be fun, you know, I mean, like, mm -hmm. I, I think that's one of the core things I would say if anyone was to ask me to, to boil down what tattooing is for me, it would have to be something fun, you know, and like, I think when I look at them tattoos, it's, it's something cool to look at, you know, and mm -hmm. it's, it's fun to look at, you check it out and they say, well, them colours, they, they go really well together and that form is really good. I mean, tattooing is everything that it's your muse everything it's I'm, the thing yeah everything yeah. that has happened to me as, as an adult has happened through tattooing good bad otherwise like everything has all come about because of this one thing that i found that i stumbled onto when i was 17 and then have that's just been my life ever since So your tattooing is like, you know, kind of the less is more. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's got, it's complicated in composition, but you kind of uh, boiled out the stuff. I like the fact that there's no really way to like kind of quantify what traditional tattooing is. You can take any image and draw it or apply it a certain way and it can look traditional. But then you can take really traditional images and do them really wrong and they're not traditional anymore. So it's not really the imagery or the subject matter, but there's some kind of unspoken parameter there that you have to stay within mm -hmm. to have that look. I think a lot of people confuse style and subject matter. Like mm -hmm. subject matter isn't style, like if you're like, oh, well I do these olive green skulls and I do these, this rose that's twisted around this. Yeah, like, yeah. like that's not style, that's subject matter. Style is, regardless of the subject matter, regardless of the, how it's applied or if it's black and gray or if it's color or whatever it is like you when you really really have a style that none of that matters you can just look at the tattoo and be like you can see that person in it yeah you can exactly. see their their hand in it you know mm -hmm. but the only way to get there is to whatever somebody walks in asking for like if you're capable of doing it and doing a good job so you kind of process even if even if thing, it's the yeah. dumbest thing you've ever heard personally like you know, like, they, they still deserve a good tattoo. They still deserve the best tattoo that you can give them, you know? First thing in draw media work, I was like, wow, those lines are so clean. The saturation is so good. It's it's not a forgiving style to work in, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> it really. But it, in the end, it's yeah. quick. Yeah. You know, because you've got it planned out. Once you get through that outline and it's tight, oh yeah. Then okay. it's just like popping the things into drawers, like yeah. just a little green here. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. I like that. Yeah. I mean, I I I have narrowed my palette, whatever you want to call it, a lot over the last few years. I'm down to like five colors now, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and you know, it'll, it'll, I'll, I'll be back up to seven next year and down to five again the year after, you know, just thinking about things. 86, and, the purple? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, is that what it is? It's gone now. I've seen that, <laughs> got it, went out the door. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean. It was working though, a lot was, of purple clouds were yeah, happening, that was yeah, working. I mean, you know, I, I don't want to. Uh, Repeat too, you don't want to be going the same road the whole time. That's it, yeah, that's it. I mean, that's what drew me to, honestly, when it comes to Austin and Texas or whatever, it was the top of my list of places I wanted to live because I was really drawn to Tony's work, I was really drawn to Jason Brooks's work. Mm -hmm. Just constantly thinking about it, and constantly, well, how did they, how did them guys do it, you know? Like, and just yeah. putting blue and red next to each other, or, you know, doing something that's so, so contrasting that, yeah. that it works, you know? For participating in this and helping to support the Gypsy Gentleman, uh, Frances Ferry has been nice enough to hand make you know, a real nice machine for you. We're giving you this. Awesome. For Thank you very much. Giving us your time. This no, weekend, that's killer. Man. Absolutely killer. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And thanks to Seth on that one. Yeah, he's a good man for sure. I love these machines too. I love you. Do you 
I don't, you know, I've, I watched my parents growing up. They worked 70 hour work weeks and they, and, you know, and they've made a hell of a successful life out of nothing but busting their ass. Mm -hmm. Nothing but busting their ass, you know. I, you know, you can, tattooing is, at least for me, like, one of the few things left in the world that, that still pays off. Like, the harder you work at it, the further you'll get in it. Yeah. You know? It really seems like there really isn't, And then, if you just keep your head down and keep kind of slowly trudging forward, like, you'll keep making ground, you know. Mm -hmm. When people complain about tattooing or the state of tattooing and I'm just like, you know, I'm a little bit bummed on that, you know, sometimes. I mean, there, there is there is things that I have to complain about, but I tend not to do it too much because it's a gift at the end of the day that the last 15 years of my life I've been doing this, you know, like, mm -hmm. and I feel like everyone, my wife, all my best friends, all the places I've seen, none of that would have come around if it hadn't been for tattooing, you know? So, you know it's definitely been a good journey so far. For sure. <laughs> so far. <Yeah. laughs> There's a lot of tattoos left in me, yeah, I hope. You know. yeah. I'm Tony, this is Brittany. She got the kamikaze pilot tattooed on her thigh. Just want to say thank you for getting me. I love it, thank you. My name's Steve, this is my uh, friend and client, Hannah. Uh, she let me do the tattoo on her today. The bat that was inspired by a flag I saw at the um, Nimitz Museum in Fredericksburg, Texas. Uh, it's like I said, thanks for letting me do that. I hope you like it. I must go to her, my love. I'm Marcus, and this is Jared, and he was good enough to come in and get a super cool, really, really old school Navy girl on his hand. I really appreciate it, man. Thanks for coming in, and thanks for supporting the Gypsy Gentleman. Thank you. You're welcome. I hope you guys enjoyed the second episode here in Austin and all the cool tattooing and all the cool places we got to see. Please come back and check out Gypsy Gentleman number three. We really appreciate the support from all the people who have been watching. And we really enjoyed ourselves filming this episode. So we'll see you down the road. And I must go to her, my love. You'll be see it's calling to me. And I must go to her, my love. I want a tiger, but I, I don't want it to look mean. Then don't get a tiger. <laughs> like yeah. tiger, that's what draws <laughs> you to the image of a tiger is the the aggression and the power of it. Like if you don't want a mean looking, get some, an image that evokes that in the simplest form possible. If yeah. you don't want to spend the rest of your life going like, well yeah, if you really look, he's not a mean tiger. Because <laughs> no matter what you do, tiger says, yeah, fuck up. Aggression. Mm -hmm. I, I tell people all the time, you know, when when they ask for certain things, I'm like, you know, man, I, I really only know how to do it one way, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, I can do it another way for sure, but I only really know what I'm doing if I do it this way, you know. So mm -hmm. you can roll the dice, but <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to do it this way. You're about you have a warm and cool colors, and he goes like, "What?" And I go like, "What? What? <laughs> what? Are you kidding? You <laughs> even know that?" Yeah. How's it going today? What are you doing? Cruising around. Nice. Let me see your outfit. Do a 360. Woo! Go, Mama, go. That's your name right there and sign right there. Marcus Ray. We're in Austin, Texas. This is the city of the Violet Crown, ladies and gentlemen. Check it out. And of course you know how it is. You get a tattoo and you, there's a certain percentage of people that are going to give you grief about it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, especially, yeah, especially on your hands, you know. You know, oh my god, you know. That's just right out there. It's more, that's... <laughs> whatever. I would do anything.